All right, we've been uh, talking about epiphany or epiphanies, different times in our lives where there are moments of revelation, when the light bulb goes on, where there's a new insight or meaning that we find. And this is how we are framing, really telling the story of Jesus. Uh, Jesus comes and he says, God is doing a new thing. The kingdom of God is at hand. Um, and really introduces a different way in which we live in a relationship uh, with God and with one another. Trouble was, the people that Jesus was speaking to had a preconceived idea what that was supposed to look like. And for many of them, it was simply about following a strict code of conduct and then receiving uh, reward. Um, certainly, you can find scripture passages that, that uh, resemble that. But Jesus comes and says, you know, there's, but there's something new happening here. And what it is, is a radical grace that transforms lives. It's not simply about following rules. It's about seeing people, seeing God with new, with new eyes. We left off last week, um, chapter 2 of Mark, and Jesus was saying, you know, it's really hard when you've got one way of doing it and to switch and do things a different way. Uh, the old, the old wineskins and new wineskins. He says, you know, it, it's, or a, a new cloth and, and an old garment. He says, it's really hard to bring an old way and a new way uh, together. And I invited you then to keep reading, to read through Mark chapter 3. And if you did, you encountered Jesus uh, showing exactly how difficult this is. Uh, he, he comes in, um, intentionally, intentionally breaks some of the rules, all right? In this case, it was Sabbath rules. There were rules that said you couldn't do any work on the Sabbath because we were supposed to honor God with the Sabbath. And Jesus says, you know, we've sort of, we have all these rules, but are these rules doing what we thought the rules were supposed to do? And he says, what's wrong with helping someone on the Sabbath? And so he intentionally breaks these rules. Today we'd call it an act of civil disobedience. He says, I, I know it's wrong. I'm going to do it. I, I, I'm going to do it on purpose because it's wrong, just to draw attention to say, is this a just law or is this not a just law? Now, this doesn't go over very well with the authorities. And it's at that moment, we read for the first time in Mark's Gospel, they said, we need to get rid of Jesus. He's going to mess things up. Uh, the, the, the system is working fine. Um, and so they say, we, Jesus has to go. So what does Jesus do? He, he calls his disciples together and he sends them out. He says, um, you need to do what I'm doing, right? He says, go out, same message, kingdom of God is near, uh, heal the people like I heal people, cast out demons the way I cast out demons. He says, there's nothing that I'm doing that you can't be doing. The message of Jesus was not, I'm something special, bow down and worship me. The message of Jesus was, God is doing incredible things here through us. And you can do these same things because it's not you doing it, it's God working through you, bringing this kingdom of God nearer to us. Um, then Mark switches gears a little bit. Uh, he's going to tell us some of the stories that Jesus told. So one of the things uh, Jesus will do, will do these actions, the, the, these acts that we see what the kingdom of God looks like, but then he also uses his words, and he tells stories. Now, if you like to read parables of, of Jesus, uh, don't go to Mark. Certainly don't go to John. John doesn't record any parables whatsoever, no stories. Uh, Mark gets a smattering, a couple little ones. Matthew and Luke just go, uh, they knock themselves out. Dozens of these parables about the kingdom of God and stories. But Mark just gives us a, a little, little glimpse into some of these teachings. And one of them is sort of this classic one, the story of the sower. You see the first one there, it's one of the few that we find in all three of the Gospels. Story about a sower that goes to sow. It actually is more of an allegory than it is really a, a parable. So let's pick up in Mark chapter four. It says, Jesus began to teach beside the sea. There was a very large crowd gathered around him, so he got in a boat. He sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land and began to teach them many things in parables. In his teachings, he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and birds came and ate it up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because it had no depth of soil. When the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns. 
The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell on good soil, brought forth grain growing up, yielding thirty, sixty, a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. It's a great story. But then Mark records Jesus saying something really weird. Um, he goes on, he says, he says this. He says, when, when Jesus was alone, those who were around him along with the twelve asked him about the parables. He said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look and not perceive, that they may indeed listen but not understand, so they may not turn again and be forgiven. I mean, what in the world? <laughs> that just sounds so completely wrong. Uh, it sounds like the parables are anti-epiphany, designed to obscure things instead of reveal something. I mean, what, what is with that? I found when we run into a difficult passage of Scripture, you have a choice you can make. Uh, one, you can just skip over it and ignore it. Um, that's what we usually do, right? You get something that doesn't fit with the way I'm thinking, you just uh, skip that. Or you can face it head on and try to figure out, well, what do I do with this? Uh, uh, and sometimes you can jump through hoops and try to make it sound or say what it obviously is not saying. Or you can simply say, I just don't get this. This is a, this is a deep mystery. It doesn't make any sense to me. And that's the route I'm taking. <laughs> um, I don't get this. You know, Mark all of a sudden quotes uh, this, uh, has Jesus quoting this verse from Isaiah. And, and, and again, it's, it's completely out of context. Isaiah was talking to people who were under God's judgment. He said, no, you're going to be punished because you've messed up. And tells Isaiah, don't try to change their minds. I want to punish them because they deserve it. All right? So don't, don't clear it up for them. Uh, they've, already, they've already made their bed. Uh, now uh, they're going to get what they deserve for it. So why would you... Why would you take that, of all things, um, from Isaiah and plop it right down here? I have no idea. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of things I don't understand. Um, and I've learned uh, life is a lot better when I don't worry about the things I don't understand. And there's enough things I understand perfectly clear that cause me to worry, um, to, to put my attention there. Um, so this is one of those, I mean, I, I would have just skipped over it, but I'm saying I want you to read the Gospel of Mark and realize there's weird things in there that if you don't understand, you're not, you're not alone. So anyway, Jesus goes on. Uh, he says, uh, do you not understand the parable? And I'm, I'm sure they were saying, yeah, we don't understand the parable. Um, how can we understand? Uh, and so Jesus goes on. He says, you know, the sower sows the word. Those are the ones on the path. When the word is sown, they hear it, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground. They hear the word. They immediately hear it, with, receive it with joy, but they have no roots. They endure only for a while when trouble or persecution arises on account of the world. They immediately fall away. And those who are sown among the thorns, those are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the lure of wealth, the desire for things to come, choke the word, and it yields nothing. And these are the ones who are sown in good soil. They hear the word, they accept it, they bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, but what do we do with that? I mean, part of it, one of the things I think, well, I simply give thanks that we have such a generous uh, sower, right? That he spreads the seed to everyone, good, bad, alike, it doesn't matter. They all get this same good news, this same Grace. Or maybe it's more about considering what kind of soil we are, right? But the thing about soil, uh, anyone who's a gardener or a farmer, they know that soil is not static. It's a, it's a, living, it's a living thing, right? Uh, bad soil can be improved. If it's compacted, you can till it. You know, if it's rocky, you can remove the rocks. If it's full of weeds, you can pull the weeds out, right? Anything is possible where it's not, things are not set. Uh, change is possible. Incredible change is possible. Um, the trouble with any allegory, though, you push it long enough, it, it starts to break down a little bit. Maybe, maybe the story was, was nothing more than simply saying the kingdom of God is something organic. It, it grows, right? It's a, it's a living, growing thing, not a rigid set of rules to follow. 
I don't know if you've ever tried to change someone's mind on something, right? Uh, there's, there's a couple ways you can, you can do that if you want to change someone's mind. Um, don't go on Facebook. That doesn't work. Um, you can try to argue someone into a different point of view, but I've found that seldom works very well. Or you can nag someone into a different point of view. Again, I don't find this terribly effective. Or you can do this. You can do something really unexpected that causes someone to rethink their assumptions and say, well, wait a second, if I was wrong on that, maybe I could be wrong on something else. That's what Jesus does all the time. This is what Jesus does. He, he, uh, he, he does this by, by what he does, by the people he hangs out with. He does it in his parables, all right? Uh, again, parables are not illustrations to make things clear. Parables are, are things that have a sort of a, something a little bit off, a little bit jarring, a little bit way of saying, well, wait a second, that's not right. Uh, well, what is right then? And I have, to, I have to think about this to figure out uh, what you're talking about. It's, there's, a, there's a word for that. We call it cognitive dissonance, all right? All of a sudden, we hear something that doesn't, that doesn't jive, it doesn't sound right, and I have to rethink what did I hear and what is my life look like, catches us off guard. Uh, if, you want to engage, if you want to engage someone's imagination, instead of just giving them some new rules and memorize these facts, uh, this is how you do it, right? You get some, a spark their imagination, get them thinking this through, try to resolve this kind of conflict they hear. That's what most of these parables do and the way they're designed to do that. Let's listen to a couple of them, right? Uh, Jesus said, is a lamp brought in and put under a bushel basket or under the bed and not on a lampstand? No, there's nothing that is hidden except to be disclosed, nothing that is secret that will not come to light. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. Measure, the measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. Those who have will be given more, and from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. He said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, would rise and sleep, and the next day the, si the seed would sprout and grow, and he doesn't know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head, and when the grain is ripe, he goes at once with his sickle, for the harvest has come. And he also said, what, what can we compare the kingdom of God? What parable can we use for it? It's like, it's like a mustard seed which is sown upon the ground. It's the smallest of all the seeds on earth, yet when it's sown, it grows up, becomes the greatest of all shrubs, puts forth large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but explained everything in private to the disciples. Again here, I think the point is not that Jesus came to set up an alternative system, uh, religious system of beliefs, right? He came to challenge people to embark on a great adventure, something that was filled with mystery and wonder. It wasn't a product he was selling. It was a process he was inviting people to go, to engage in, to think about God in a different way and how that re uh, would affect all their relationships. As we keep reading Mark, we're going to see this again and again as he goes through. And throughout history, there have been, there have been people of God who have caught a vision of what the world would look like, right, if the kingdom of God that Jesus embodied was actually um, in our lifetime as well. And they've given their lives to work towards that goal. Certainly one of them was, was, uh, was Martin Luther King Jr., who's whose birth is uh, celebrated tomorrow, right? He had this vision. He had this, we all know the story. He had a dream, right? The dream that his children live in a nation where they would, they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We know that dream. It's a good dream. It's one worth fighting for. In, in King's case, it was a, was a dream he was worth, uh, that he was willing to die for. The civil rights mov movement that King was a part of was, was such a critical time uh, in the life of our, of our country. And um, it helped us start to turn a corner. Some of this blatant racism that had been there for so long uh, was made illegal. But the challenge is you can make something illegal doesn't automatically change people's 
hearts and minds. That takes, takes more than simply enacting a law. The much harder work that we have, uh, dismantling uh, systemic racism, I mean, it's still something we were working on. We still, it's still before us. Um, today, I mean, many of us can go through our daily lives and not even think about race. I mean, I do all the time. I, I, most days, I don't even think about race. It's an indication of, uh, of, of, of someone who's benefiting from white privilege. I don't even have, I don't even have to think about it, right? Uh, it's so ingrained, it's so normalized that most of us are not even conscious of it. I know it's true for me. Uh, but if any ch- change, if we're going to change a systemic system like this, begins with some kind of awareness. And, and it makes, for those of us who are white, it's so easy to get really defensive about this and say, ah, I don't have any white privilege. Um, you know, but we haven't, maybe we're not actively racist, but we live in a system that benefits us simply because of our race. That doesn't mean that, my, that I haven't worked hard or my ancestors or my uh, people came before me didn't work hard or didn't face difficulties. It simply means that, that their race wasn't one of the obstacles that was in the way for them. Racism is so integrated into the fabric of our nation. I don't think it's possible to understand what it means to be an American apart from really understanding that role that race has played in it. And we are all, all in this, all in this together. Um, King wrote a lot of different things. One of the things he wrote was uh, uh, was sort of an essay. Uh, it's a long letter. He was imprisoned in uh, Birmingham from an action that was going on there, and he writes this letter, and he writes it to, to white Christians, particularly white clergymen who were a little critical of King, saying, you know, slow down, you're going too fast, you're, you're, you're pushing us too, too far, and all these kinds of things. Uh, and, and King comes back and he says, uh, you know, writes this letter, uh, and one of it, part of it, it says, he says, you know, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Um, now, that's a little um, deep, but he said it in another way that, that, uh, I, that I really like. He says, you know, we came here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat, <laughs> right? Um, th- that sense that our lives are interconnected. You can't have uh, oppression for one without affecting the other one, or freedom for one without affecting the other one. We're, we're somehow in this together. We still have work ahead of us if we're going to realize uh, this, this dream. Um, let's get the band back up. I'm going to close here just with a couple other of my favorite um, uh, King quotes. Um, I love this one. He says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Um, or this one. I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. And one of my favorites uh, says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Amen. Amen.